throughout history, God has used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And we have been looking at these ordinary heroes of the faith. And what intrigues us about these people, what we get so excited about and interested in is how extraordinary their faith was. And we've been in Hebrews chapter 11 looking at uh, this hall of fame of faith, this list of, of people who just had this extraordinary faith. And we've been studying them in more detail. We've talked about Noah and Abraham and those types of things uh, so far. And uh, I just want to re remind us of what Hebrews says about what faith is. If you were to define it, you could find that in verse 1, which says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That could be the definition of faith. And is this is what the ancients or the ancestors, the, the, the people of old, this is what they were commended for. This is what uh, made God happy and excited God about what they did. It was basically them uh, through their <clears throat> word of mouth, through their actions and the way they lived, that they demonstrated their faith. And that's what pleased God. That's what won God's approval ultimately that they said that God is in control and they lived it out that way and then in verse 6 we learn that without faith it is impossible to please God and if you if you're like me we constantly think that it's it's the things that uh, we know how much we know or what our skill set is, what our, you know, that we do these works and these, these task lists, these Christian task lists to win God's approval, but it's actually faith that pleases Him. Again, we talked about Noah last week. We talked about Abraham, and we was in verse 8, which said that by faith, Abraham, and then it listed kind of what he did, and it was by his faith that he chose to do those things. And then we went back into Genesis, and we looked in detail of what it was that Abraham did. And we, we know that Abraham trusted, obeyed, and went when God told him to go. When God told him to go, he went. He trusted him and believed him. God definitely had this... This cool promise for him. He promised him blessings and to make him a great nation and to give him this land. So, yeah, there's some incentive there, but it still took faith for him to go somewhere where he had no idea where he was going. He didn't know what the game plan was, but he went anyway. He believed and had faith that despite being an old man, that he was going to have a son. Why? Because God told him that he would. And that, again, that uh, he would make a great nation of Abraham. So when you're 99 years old, or I guess back when he was first told about being a great nation, he was 75. But when you're that old and you're told that you're going to have a kid, and you have faith in that, that takes a lot of faith to, to truly believe that. And then, of course, the, the epic story, the epic historical event of uh, Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. But then God rushed in, stopped, stopped him from doing that, and uh, provided a sacrifice. And if you're like, dude, what are you talking about? Well, if you missed it last week or you fell asleep, you'll have to go back and either read that. Okay, or check out the, the sermons that, uh, that we put on online. So, um, so then we move forward into Genesis, and we, we learn that throughout that, God is talking about this everlasting covenant. He's telling Abraham this everlasting covenant with you, Abraham, and me, God, and your descendants. <clears throat> And that's where we, we hear about and we read about all throughout Scripture. You all probably heard this. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. Jacob, right? We hear that. That's how he identifies himself throughout Scripture. 
I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe that's what he tells Moses right out of the gate. This is God's chosen people. God picked Abraham. Out of all the people, he picked Abraham, who was really a, a pagan. He worshipped idols, and he picked him to, to uh, be a great nation, to be God's chosen people. We read in Hebrews verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob, Esau, in regard to their future. And then verse 21, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. So when I read verse 20 and 21 about Isaac and Jacob, I'm kind of underwhelmed, to be honest with you. I kind of read that, and I'm like, where's the, the stuff like Noah? Noah obviously built an ark. God's going to wipe out humanity, and Noah has to build this ark. You have Abraham who, who went, went and obeyed God and who offered up his son Isaac. You have these big things that these guys did, and then you read about Isaac and Jacob, and it, it just says, you know, that they blessed their kids, basically. So where's the, where's the heroes of faith part, right? They're in the list, so what, what happened? So we have to go to where the historical events were originally documented, and that's in uh, the book of <coughs> Genesis. So we are going to be in the book of Genesis looking at the NIV version. So if you have your Bible app, now would be the time to take that out. So who are we going to talk about today? Well, honestly, you know, Isaac, Isaac's <laughs> life's kind of chill. I mean, there's a couple things that goes on in Isaac's life. He makes some, some bonehead decisions like, uh, like we all do. But for the most part, he lived out and demonstrated uh, faith. Um, when he and his wife couldn't have a kid, he went to God and prayed to God. So that they would have a child, which was different than his dad, Abraham, who when they couldn't have a child for 20 plus years, uh, his wife said, hey, well, won't you just sleep with my servant? That way you can have a child that way. And uh, so they did, you know, so they took matters into their own hands. So Isaac doing things a little bit different than his dad did. And uh, but. Not a lot to say really about Isaac. You can go and read about Isaac in the book of Genesis, but we're going to talk about Jacob because there's some stuff about Jacob, y'all. All right, so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 25. I'll give you a chance to get there. Genesis chapter 25. So I will tell you that Jacob and his wife, Rebecca, um, was having difficulties uh, having a child as well. And Jacob went to God and, and asked God to, uh, to give them a child. And he responded, and, and Rebecca became pregnant. So they were married about 20 years uh, before Rebecca became pregnant. And I'm going to be in verse 22. So Rebecca's now pregnant, okay? And then Genesis chapter 25, verse 22. Here's what they wrote. <clears throat> the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So I want you to think about that for just a minute. You've got Rebecca who's pregnant, who's got some stuff going on, right? And so much so that she prays to God, like, what is going on in my belly right now? So to uh, her surprise, um, God reveals that there are Twins, surprise, you're going to have twins. You wanted to have a kid, you're going to get two, all right? So just to make up for time. But it's interesting that 
what he talks about in, in describing those children. That there are two nations in her womb. And it also mentions that the older will serve the younger. That is not the way things went down back then. It was totally different. The, the younger served the older. It was the older that, that would uh, receive the birthright that was owed to him. So like uh, if there were two kids, for example, when, when the dad passed on and the things <clears throat> were uh, passed away and the things were passed on to the kids, the oldest one would get like two-thirds of the stuff of the birthright and then the younger would get one third. So again, you have this natural human kind of rights that we have and that's the older gets more versus really God's sovereign election. He chose and revealed through prophecy that it was going to be the younger that would be uh, almost like the oldest son that would receive the rights of the oldest son and the blessing and the birthright. And that's how uh, Rebecca found out was God revealed that to her. So then we go to verse 24. And this is when uh, it's come time for, for her to have the baby. It says, verse 24, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her, in her womb. So God called it, okay? No ultrasounds required. He let them know. <coughs> so they were, they, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. So, which means Harry. It'd be like if, if it was American, we would have called him Harry, right? So, verse 26. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So, he was named Jacob, which means supplant or to replace. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter and a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, pay attention now, verse 28, Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So, you have Esau, the oldest He's this just kind of hairy, scruffy, bass pro shop, <laughs> brawny kind of guy, okay? And then who likes to hunt and, and those types of things, okay? And then you've got Jacob, who's not that at all. And he's kind of, he's, he's a mama's boy, homeboy, right? He likes to be in the house and, and do the things around the house and those types of things. Dad likes the brawny guy, okay, Esau. So as you uh, could pick up on it, they, they, remember they were jostling in the belly. I wonder if they were, were wrestling and fighting for the birthright at that point. Were they, were they fighting to be first out? You know what I mean? It's like, no, no, you get behind me. No, no, you get behind me, right? And, and we see that even when... Jacob has the heel of Esau's foot, as if to say, no, you can't be first. But that's how, how it happens. So if you've got some uh, rivalry stories about your kids, okay, imagine how this already started. So the rivalry has begun. And listen, parental favoritism uh, is, is not healthy. It's not a good thing. <laughs> And you're going to see that as the story, uh, as history moves forward, as it relates to how uh, Jacob, nope, how Isaac feels about Esau and how Rebecca feels about Jacob. And I can relate to that. I remember, I'm the oldest, and I remember how much my parents loved me more than my brothers and sisters. <laughs> And it caused problems for them. And I don't have time to go into that, but 
but it's a big deal. So we move forward to verse 29. And in verse 29, uh, they're older. And we're about to see kind of what this sibling rivalry kind of looks like. Verse 29 says, Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. That is why he was called Edom. Because... <clears throat> He wanted to eat him some stew. <laughs> Actually, yeah, it's not true. Some of y'all don't get that. See me afterwards. Uh, Edom means red. It means red. Um, and then in verse 31, Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. All right, so check this out. So his brother rose up in there starving, hungry. I don't know how long he was out there, not, not able to hunt and find what he was looking for. Comes in famished. Give me some stew. Give me some stew. Come on, I am starving. And Jacob says, sell me your birthright. Dude, that's no joke. They're not playing around. That's, that's a big deal. Verse 32. Look. I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. <clears throat> then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and they got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, when I read about that event, I'm like, dang, talking about cutthroat, man, that's, that's, that's some rough stuff. I mean, Jacob is ruthless. He is selfish. It's all about what he wants, and he'll do whatever it takes to get what he wants, and he will take advantage of any situation. <clears throat> But then we sit there, I'm not letting Esau off the hook. You know, he's an impulsive guy. He's living for the moment. It's all about pleasures now. He's not, think, he's not looking forward. He's not thinking about the future. How much does he have to just blow off his birthright to give that up just for some stew? Now, I've had some good stew, but to give up your birthright for that? Now, it's easy for me to, to look back and read these and judge these guys and go, man, they, they're terrible, right? But then when I start to think about it, I'm like, man, I, I could be like Jacob. I could be like Jacob a lot. Definitely more in my past, but I can be ruthless or I've been ruthless before and selfish. Shut up, Paul. My brother's starting to <laughs> point out some things. I mean, I've been known to take advantage of some situations and some people that was uncalled for, things that I'm ashamed of. And then I think about Esau. I, I've been like Esau. I struggle with that to this day, being impulsive and wanting to live for the moment. Kind of just shrugging off my birthright, my birthright, my relationship with God and the promise that God has made me because of dedicating my life to Christ and accepting Him as my Savior and, and that birthright that I have. And oftentimes I shrug it off for the pleasures of this world, the immediate pleasures. People do that all the time. You hear about Christians who shrug off their birthright for instant pleasures, whether that be pornography, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, just money and fame and those types of things. So we got to be careful not to just jump on Jacob and Esau. We got to look at the mirror sometimes, right? So now we move to Genesis chapter 27. I'll give you a chance to flip there. Surely things are going to get better, right? <clears throat> I mean, we are talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
So we are in chapter 27, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll, we'll dig in and read. So you got old man Isaac, all right, the dad, who's basically gone blind because of his old age. He's probably uh, <laughs> maybe starting to get a little senile, who knows, but he feels that death is, is coming. He, he can just tell. And it's in that moment that he calls to Esau, the oldest son, the one that he loves. And he calls to him and he says, listen, come to me. Look, I'm about to die. I can, I can tell my body's shutting down. I need you to go out and hunt some game and bring it back and feed me an awesome meal. And when, after you do that, I'm going to give you my blessing." Now, again, in this culture, that was a big deal to receive the blessing from your father. And Mama Rebecca overheard what Papa Isaac said. And we know who, who does Rebecca love? Jacob. Jacob. So she starts to get a little worried and, and jealous. And so she starts to to plan and connive and think, what, what can we do? So she comes up with this idea, this scheme, to basically trick Isaac and for Isaac to give Jacob the blessing instead of Esau. Now I want you to think about that for just a minute. And you may be going, dude, that's crazy. I can't believe people would do that. How many people have you known that have done things like that in this world? Where people will cheat people out of the things that they're due or the things that they're owed so that they can come out ahead. We read about that all the time in the news. You may experience that frequently within your family. You may have been directly impacted in such a way as that. So... Rebecca tells Jacob, Jacob's like, okay, okay, but how is this going to work? Uh, Esau's hairy. He's the brawny Bass Pro Shop guy, and I'm not. What if, what if dad reaches out and tries to touch me? So she basically says, look, you go out and kill some goats. Bring it in. I'll cook it up because I know what your daddy likes. Okay? I'll cook it up. And we'll take the goat skin and we'll put it on, you, on your arms and on the back of your neck. That way, if he touches you, you feel like uh, Esau. She also says, I'll get some of his clothes and, and that way you kind of smell like him. You, you all have done that before. Maybe somebody, your, your dad or your parents. I remember uh, I could take shirts of my dad and I could smell him. In his shirts, right? I, I would wear his T-shirts when I was a kid, and they'd go down to here. How many of you all have done that, right? The V-neck, wow! Well, <laughs> and and <clears throat> but you can smell your dad, right? So that's kind of the game plan. And Jacob's scared to death. Jacob's scared that I'm not. I'm not going to get a blessing. I'm going to be cursed by my dad. And Rebecca says, "Look, I'll take the curse on. You just do what I told you." So then. Verse 18 is where we're going to start reading. So we're talking about Jacob. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please set up and eat some of the games so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. It's interesting that he kind of had doubts about that, right? And then verse 22. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, 
<clears throat> so he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate. And he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches, richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. And we're going to stop reading there. So Jacob received the blessing, deceived his dad and received the blessing. Well, guess who comes back? Esau. Esau comes back. He's been working hard to to hunt so he can cook for his dad. And he comes back in and excited. He's like, Dad, I'm home. <clears throat> Ready to cook for you. Ready for that blessing. And he goes to Isaac, and Isaac's like, what? what? I mean, he is nervous and, and almost terrified at what's happening right now. And he said, I already gave the blessing to you. And he's like, no, dude, I, I've been, I have been out trying to get food. And he's, I've already given your blessing. It was your brother. He tricked me. I, and uh, Esau, there's too many names. So Esau is like, listen, what, you got any leftover blessing? Can you bless me too? I mean, can you give me a little something, something? And Jacob said, not Jacob, Abraham said, Isaac. Dang it! <laughs> Isaac! That's why God writes it down. So, so, I don't know what I'm saying. So, Isaac said, Look, what's done is done. What's done is done. I can't change it. Esau is fired up. He is ticked. He is ready to kill, literally, ready to kill Jacob. So much to the point that he's like, as soon as our dad dies, as soon as morning is over, I'm taking him out. So Rebecca overhears this and in an effort to try to protect Jacob. She, again, just trying to connive and scheme and come up with things and says, listen, you go to my brother and you stay there until things cool off. And then goes to Isaac and says, look, uh, I don't want your son Jacob marrying these women around here. We need to send him off so he can marry our kind uh, back where my brother's at. And uh, Isaac agrees to that, okay, and sends him <clears throat> off with the blessing. What we've picked up on real quick that this is Jacob's nature. This is who he is. This is what he does. He schemes. He connives. He manipulates. He'll lie to get whatever it is that he wants. He will grab your heel. He will steal your birthright. He will trick people into giving uh, the blessings to him. What I also <coughs> notice about Jacob is it seems like he is always reaching out for the blessing. He's always reaching out to, to come ahead. But the one thing uh, that he's not reaching out for is a relationship with God. And that's what Abraham and Isaac did. <clears throat> but how is this so? I mean, we're talking about the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I just want to kick Jacob right in the mouth. I don't know about you guys. He's a punk, right? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about him so far? This can't be the hero of our faith. This can't be the one 
that God made the covenant with, the promise with. This can't be God's chosen people. You got it wrong, right? But I sit here and I think about this as I read this. And like Jacob, for many of us, we do the same thing, don't we? We, we are constantly seeking the blessings of this world. And we're constantly seeking the blessings from God. God bless me. God, God make my family well. God, make, make me prosper. Help me with this promotion. God, 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 uh, bless me, bless me, bless me. But we don't focus on the relationship. Oftentimes, we live off our parents' relationship with God. See, our parents had the relationship. We just kind of, the faith got passed down to us, but we don't, we want the blessing, but we don't want to focus on the relationship. <clears throat> but we get, we begin to see faith awakening in Jacob as he starts to grow. Thank goodness. Right? In chapter 28, Jacob has a dream. And in the dream, there's a ladder that angels are ascending and descending. It's pretty crazy. You'll have to go back and read that. But Jacob feels the presence of God. He feels his presence. So much so that the covenant is renewed. With Jacob, God renews the covenant with Jacob. And so much so that God, or I'm sorry, Jacob vows, he commits to live a life for God, to commit his life to God. So much so that he's willing to give a tenth of all of his stuff. He trusts God so much to, to give that back to God. And then in chapter 32, he turns to God. And ask for God's help. And ask for God to be involved when it's time for Esau to hunt him down and Esau's on his way to come kill him. And you may say, well, that's kind of convenient that he reaches out to God to ask for help in that situation. But here's what you got to understand about Jacob and what we need to understand. Prior to that, what would he do to, to get what he wanted or to get out of things? He would lie. He would connive. He would... He would cheat. He would do whatever it would take. He would scheme to try to uh, get the outcome that he felt like he wanted. But he didn't this time. He went to God and talked to him and asked for God to be involved. And then also in chapter 32, and this is where we're going to read. So that I'm not butchering all the names and all that kind of stuff. So chapter 32. We're going to be at verse 24, so I'll give you a chance to get there. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it helps when uh, the, the people that wrote the Bible put the headers in there. And, and what's the header say for that particular section? Jacob wrestles with God. Jacob wrestles with God or something of that nature, right? So that's helpful because if that's not there and you just start to read this story you're like what in the heck is it going on here okay so in this part of the of the story uh, jacob's kind of up late at night and this is where verse 24 comes in so jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak so when you're reading this you're going to find out that this dude just kind of appears out of nowhere and starts this wrestling match with him, which is a bit weird, okay? <laughs> so I want to read that again. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So they're wrestling all night until the sun comes up. Now, here's the thing about wrestling and grappling. I can wrestle and grapple with the best of them for about a minute and a half. Then my body shuts down, I'm out of breath, and you, it's over. You're, you're going to take me out. If you watch professional UFC fighters, grapplers, uh, you know, they're going at it. I mean, if they do three rounds of five-minute rounds, you'll see some of them, ha you know, halfway through the second round. I mean, they can't even hardly hold their arms up. I mean, they've definitely slowed down. But things are going, man. They're wrestling, going hard at it until 
daybreak. Verse 25, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, so he could not overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. So think about that for a second. I've gotten up before and just get a catch in my hip and I'm right, and you're like a baby deer trying to figure out how to walk. I mean, it'll shut you down. <laughs> And they're having this wrestling match, and this is what happens. He basically dislocates his hip. In verse 26, the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. All right, again, thank you for the header in the Bible. I appreciate that because I get a hint that he's wrestling God. But up until that point, without that, if I'm reading that, why is he asking this dude for a blessing? At what point did it change for Jacob and that he recognized that this wasn't just a man? Verse 26. I want to read it again. <clears throat> Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. I'm curious, are they still wrestling? You know, did they stop? <laughs> did they go to neutral corners? And, and did they have this dialogue? Or are they, are they gripped up here? You know how people's heads are right by each other, ear to ear. Are they asking these questions? Who are you? Um, Jacob, who are you? Right? I'm curious. I just want to know. <laughs> Verse 28. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it's, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. I'm going to stop there. Dude, that's a crazy story. This is a historical event. <clears throat> Again, at what point did Jacob recognize that this isn't a man? That this is an angel of God or God himself? He's asking the question, I think, just to verify. I know who you are. Who are you? Who are you? Tell me, tell me what your name is because he knows. This wrestling match with God is a turning point in the life of Jacob. Because all the way up until this point, Jacob was constantly trying to obtain a blessing on his own merit and his own abilities and his own wit and deceiving people. He was always doing it on his own. It wasn't until this, this match that he wasn't going to let the man go. He wasn't going to let God go until God blessed him. It's interesting that the angel of God or God, whatever it was, there's a lot of discussion on if it's actually God in human form or the angel of God. It's interesting that he dislocated his hip. When you dislocate your hip and you are a wrestler or a grappler, it, it shuts you down. I mean, you got to be able to rotate and twist and, and to be able to wrestle and fight. So you are taking away that person's strength when you dislocate the hip. It is very difficult for the, that person to be effective on their own now. And it was as if God was wrestling with him and basically took all the strengths that Jacob had and dislocated them. He dislodged them. He, that they were no longer useful. He took his wit and his own power and his conniving and his scheming. And 
He shut that down. He took that strength away from Jacob. And it was because of that, it was out of his weakness, that Jacob called out in faith for God to bless him. And it was that blessing that became a transformation of Jacob and his nature moving forward. It wasn't that he was perfect, but it changed him because of God's grace. It wasn't until that one-on-one -on -one battle between Jacob and God that Jacob started to change. Have you ever wrestled with God? Has your wrestling with God changed the way you walk? <clears throat> because this injury followed Jacob throughout the rest of his life. When we wrestle with God and he breaks us down and he takes all our selfish ambition and just shuts it down and it's just you and him. And you decide to put all your trust and all your faith in him. Does that change the way you walk? It should change everything about us. It should absolutely change our walk. When we have this wrestling match with God and we finally figure it out. That I can't do this on my own and through my own strength. That I need God. I need His blessing. Not the blessings that I can conjure up and figure out. But I need His blessing. I need His love. And once I figure that out, that has to change everything. It changes our decisions that we make. How we act. How we treat people. How we treat ourselves. Because of God. It was from then on that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were now called sons of Israel or Israelites. Because <clears throat> remember, his name was changed from Jacob to what? Israel. Israel. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, Paul writes to the church, he says, If you belong to Christ, so he's talking to us, listen. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if we are in Christ, if we have accepted Christ as our Savior, we in essence have accepted the covenant, the, the promise that God originally made Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's through that lineage, that genealogy of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we get Jesus. When you open the book of Matthew, and you want to read about the life of Jesus in the Gospels. The very first part of the book of Matthew is genealogy. Abraham had him who had him. It's the, it's the part you skip over. You go, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Flip. All right. That's showing you the lineage. That's showing you Abraham, Isaac, Jacob to, to David. To Jesus. So it is God's promise that he would bless Abraham, that he would bless Isaac and Jacob and, and make them, uh, give them a, a huge nation. That's a us. We are a family of believers. We are God's people. Not because... Uh, well, I did that DNA thing, and I didn't pick up, I don't have any Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in me. No, it's because of Christ. It is because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. That is why the covenant 
holds true with us. That is why the promise of, of blessings and, and everlasting life now with God is for all of us. We are God's people. Praise God for that. So, the challenge for us is to lighten up on Jacob a little bit because a lot of us, especially me, have a lot of Jacob in me. But thank God for his grace and thank God for Jesus. You guys are awesome. I love you. Y'all have a great week. Hope so.